I want to say that in the first paragraph, she describes him as a young man whose hair was already white. And I immediately felt kind of attacked. <laughs> oh. <laughs> as you should have. <laughs> I don't think he intended to kill himself. See, this is why I think at this end of the story is vague. Thank you. I don't think I, he intended to. Well, what was he doing hanging himself by the neck? It doesn't say that. It doesn't say he hung by the neck. Welcome to Classical Etc. You're in the studio with Shane Saxon. Welcome to another episode of Classical Etc. We're just going to dive right into our topic today. And that is we are reading and discussing a short story, The Lame Shall Enter First by Flannery O'Connor. And I, I feel duty bound to say that this is maybe not a, a short story for children. No, no. <laughs> Don't read this for your kids. <laughs> some strong language, uh, some heavy themes. Very heavy themes. And also, I think this story's going to be impossible to talk about without spoilers. Yes. So I would say if Spoiler you haven't read it. I don't it, think that there can be spoilers in a Flannery O'Connor story. Well, well, okay. well the way we're going to have to talk about, yes. Yes. Uh, I, I, I read this. This is the second time I've read this. And it wasn't the fact that I read it. The, I was shocked. Both <laughs> uh, and the fact that I, that I read it the first time was not a spoiler for reading it the second time by any means. It just gets deeper. Yeah. Well, sure. No. You can always plumb more. What I'm saying depth, is but, I think we have to talk about the ending. Mm. And so if you haven't read the story, we're going to spoil the ending. We are. It's going to be not, hard. You don't. <laughs> You don't read a Flannery O'Connor story for the surprising end. Well, it's, it's, it's some like people quite don't, surprising. Some huh? people don't you, like to know so? the end of a story. And some people love to know the end of a story. I, I, I have do. a cousin who always goes and reads the last chapter of a book before she reads the first chapter to know whether she wants to read the whole book. I've done In a Flannery O'Connor story, you're not sitting there anticipating anxiously uh, what's going to happen next. I, You're in fear I totally of what's coming disagree. next. <laughs> yeah. I, well, you are That's in fear true. of what's coming next. That's true. But I do think that you're anxious to know how it ends, but we're going to tell people how it ends. So my point is, I if don't you don't so. want to know how it ends, turn it off, read the story. And then turn it back yeah. on. Okay, I think that's a fair you're, warning. You're, you're, you're hurting our ratings. To say, it's to say turn it it's off. You think the they'll truth. read the story and not turn it back on? <laughs> <laughs> that could be. I am, no, because they're going to they're gonna turn it off. They're going to start reading and saying, go, oh my gosh. And then they'll, they'll never come back. That's right. <laughs> okay. Let me offer a brief synopsis of the plot just to orient our discussion. So honestly, and not a lot happens. Um, it's one of those kinds of stories where it's more about the characters and their interactions than s major events. But you have this main character, Shepard, and I think we'll come back to that name, Shepard, later. And he is a father, and he has a son. That son is Norton, and he does not like his son very much. However, he really likes this orphan boy, uh, Rufus Johnson. And so he wants to save Rufus Johnson and brings him into his home and Rufus Johnson declares himself under the influence of Satan and he terrorizes Shepard and Norton. And this story is largely about them relating to each other and Shepard attempting to save Rufus, Rufus terrorizing Shepard. And in the end, Shepard has this realization that he should have spent more time with his son or caring about his son and not Rufus. And then we come to the final scene where which we're not to say, are we? Uh, yeah, we're, well, that's, we're, that's, that's the whole point Johnny say. gave. Yes. But here's the thing. It's not actually totally clear. <laughs> Shall I read the sentence to oh, you, Shane? Yes. No, wait, wait. Okay. Are we going to the end already? I think, okay, now I'm on the other side of this issue. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Maybe we should have rehearsed this one. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think starting at the end is a good way to start. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read the whole last paragraph. Okay. okay. And Norton is Shepard's son. So... The light was on in Norton's room, but the bed was empty. He turned and dashed up the attic stairs and at the top reeled back like a man on the edge of a pit. The tripod had fallen and the telescope lay on the floor. A few feet over it, the child hung in the jungle of shadows just below the beam from which he had launched his flight into space. So okay, it, now we've it, ruined the whole story. Can it implies it? that he killed himself by hanging, right? Yes. Yes. But it doesn't necessarily <laughs> state that. I, it's totally uh, he's the child hung. Yeah, in the jungle of shadows, right? The, the launching his flight into shadows. space. I mean, I guess is a you, metaphor are, for well, death. Are you taking I mean, this into the supernatural? I, I, I think, don't know. I think it's, I think it's the like, death is 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 a logical 
the you, yeah. I don't I definitely you, you just knew need that to be that's plain. What the death is a logical. She was indicating, but like, why is it not like more clear? I didn't have any doubt. <laughs> Okay, so now we've basically told all the people in the audience who have not read this story that a uh, a child kills himself in the end. So yeah. I'm sure that they're right. Even, uh, so but, let's they, but they've told they've turned it off and read the story, and then they've turned it back on. <laughs> so let's move, let's go back now. So we know <laughs> where dreams. this ends up. The child is dead. This whole story is leading towards this death, and I think it's doing it with the character of Shepherd. So. Martin, how do you take this character, Shepard? What do you think Shepard represents? What stands out to you about the character, Shepard? Shepard, his name is ironic. Mm-hmm. because it, It's spelled S-H-E-P-P-A-R-D, so it's not the regular spelling of Shepard as the person who takes care of sheep. But he fashions himself as somebody who is... Um, a shepherd. Is, is a shepherd, or he's trying to help. He's trying to, to oversee. He's trying mm-hmm. to... He fashions himself this this way, but I think that what you find throughout the, through the story is that he really is not loving somebody. Mm. He's he's got this. He's he's a he's a scientist, very scientistic kind of person. He's an he's a soulless intellectual uh, who thinks that by artificial means you can help people. This, this is really what's going on. There's this, 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 this theme of artificiality runs through this whole thing. So he has, he, he thinks he's, he's helping out, which just makes Rufus Johnson all the, all the, or the more angry. But there's this great line that's at the beginning of the, about Shepard, uh, the part two, there's just a one separation in this story. Um, I have more than one. And, um, yeah, mine doesn't. Just has, uh, So it says, Shepherd's attic was a large unfinished room with exposed beams and no electric light. And after <laughs> reading a part of this story, I got to that line and I just busted out laughing because what is he describing here? <laughs> He's a large unfinished room, his, his, his attic. A large unfinished. You pointed to your brain there. Uh, with exposed beams and no electric light, and I just, I just thought that was so funny yeah, because yeah. this is what O'Connor does so well, is to take these normal words and and you you could blow by them so easily, and yet right here was a commentary on his whole psyche, all the words he uses, the intellect that mm. he's smart, he's intelligent. They're all psychological terms. He, they're all these artificial, scientific terms he uses for Rufus and his problems, and that's not Rufus's problem, and Rufus knows it. Yeah. So, on Shepard? Yeah, I think on Shepard, I want to say that in the first paragraph, she describes him as a young man whose hair was already white. And I immediately felt kind of attacked. Oh. <laughs> As you yeah. should have. I, Sorry, I cut you off. What were you you don't think there's anything Oh, wrong? that's good. Oh, never mind. Uh, um, I was going to yeah, ask. Before we go on. Well, well I wasn't gonna a, go gonna going to go on. I was going to ask you a question okay, about Okay, well, Shepherd. it was about his comment. He oh, just, okay. It was uh, uh, near the end of the story. Um, he's trying to convince himself he hasn't done wrong in this whole tr- by trying to help Rufus. And he says, slowly his face drained of color. It became almost gray beneath the white halo of his hair. Mm. So that's mentioned, the whiteness of his hair. So now it's a halo. Does that make you feel better? Uh, Because, (laughs) well, at the beginning, it says it stood up like a narrow brush halo over his pink sensitive face. So that halo is. There's something kind of falsely angelic about him. Like well, he sets himself up as some kind Rufus of Rufus sees it. He yeah, says, he yeah. says, you think you're God. Yeah. You think you're Jesus. You got a halo. Right. And yeah. this, yeah. the hair is, the white yeah. hair is his halo. So I was going to ask you, Martin, do you think, so at the beginning, all he wants is for his child to be unselfish. But I got the feeling that Shepherd was the selfish one, that he mm-hmm. was trying to save Rufus for his own Gratification. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And yes. Can, can we say also about Shepard, so that people know, if, uh, just in case they haven't read the story, um, I forget what it says he does in terms of a job. Um, oh, he's the he works at the reformatory. No, I mean, this, no, 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 no. He's he, not paid he, for that. Oh, he's the, city re, he's the city recreational director. 
He's a city re- recreation, but on the side, he helps at the reformatory. That's right, yeah. as a counselor. He's, he's, he's the worst kind of do-gooder, right. we might yeah. say. That's right, but he's so critical of everybody else. Yes. Yeah. When he's really the problem yes. here. No, he's not. He's, he's causing more damage. Actually. Well, it, but what's interesting is like everything he's trying to do Right, he's trying to help kids in the reformatory. He's trying to provide Rufus a new shoe because he's got this club foot. Mm-hmm. You know, all of this stuff is they are all good things. Mm-hmm. But he's trying to do it devoid of faith. Mm. Right? It's it, it, that's really what makes him uh would you say a do gooder in the worst sense or mm-hmm. something like that? I mean is is because there it, it is not coming from an authentic place. That's right. And everything he's using to deal with Rufus, who is basically a little criminal, mm-hmm. right? Every Everything he uh, attempts to use to, because he wants to fix Rufus, mm-hmm. right? He wants right. to fix mm-hmm. him. And his means for doing that are all extrinsic and they're all artificial. He never deals with a central problem that Rufus keeps telling him he has. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That he's serving Satan. Right. right. <laughs> and why doesn't why doesn't he why doesn't Shepherd believe that? Yeah, so I think this is an important part that I think we need to expand on. Because we haven't said this yet. When Shepherd talks to Rufus, Rufus says, I am under the control of Satan. I'm going to hell. I'm going to hell. And that theme seems to come up again and again. And I read that the first time, kind of not knowing where the story was going, as an ironic truth. That like maybe there's this sense in which Rufus is Satan in this character, in this story. Symbolically. Symbolically. Yeah. Well, maybe even literally. Is he like possessed by Satan? I don't know. No, I think he does. Nobody's told him about redemption. No, 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 he no. He's well aware. He well, he does tell. Yes. Yeah, so he teaches Norton about yeah. redemption, but he chooses not to be redeemed himself or doesn't think he that he's he worthy. If he, if he chooses, if he, cho- if he chooses God, if he, yeah. you know, yeah. He do, can be saved. You, he says it. He says, I can be saved. But yeah, he, right. So, it doesn't happen in the story. So but. even at the end, even when we last see him, he has not chosen to be saved. Right. But that doesn't when mean he's on he the way to jail. Can't eventually. Happen. Right. So whenever you're reading a story, it seems like one of the things we're all doing in, intuitively, perhaps, is trying to find the protagonist. And the way that this story starts, Shepard is put right in front of you, right? And he's the one helping people. And he, he spends his life helping boys. And it's uncomfortable how much he dislikes his son. I just to me he was never the protagonist because of that because of the way he treated his son from the beginning you know when he says his mom has been dead for a year that is plenty of time to grieve he should be over it which is again that scientific right he's this, he, he's he's, he's one a, of the there's NIC a rule for e this in, in C.S. Lewis is that hideous strength it's these these people who are so intellectual and so mechanistic that it's like they don't have a soul or something he's he's he should still be grieving for his wife, really. Mm-hmm. Right. right. But Especially Nor- since he isn't a believer. Right. He has no th- thought that he will ever see her well, again. It's really the, the fact that he's not a believer, which is which has uh, robbed him of being able to grieve because and he tells Norton like she doesn't exist anymore. Right. Yeah, mm-hmm. like right. this is supposed to comfort Norton. Right. That his mother does not exist anymore. <laughs> right. And, and he says, at, if she were in hell, at least I'd know she exists, yes. right? That's a powerful line. Yeah. Yes, it is. Yes. But when then, after kind of leading you to examine Shepard, and I think we all kind of like, ah, this guy's not a protagonist. Mm-hmm. The next character that we start to get to know is Rufus. And he's maybe our protagonist, but then he is a self-proclaimed under the influence of Satan. <laughs> but in some ways you view him. At least he's honest. Yeah, at least he's honest. At, <laughs> at least, least he, he believes tells something. the truth. Right. Yeah. Okay, so can, if, if Satan's the father of lies, can he really be under the power of Satan? Right? He's constantly that's telling a good the truth. Point. Yeah, that's a really good point. Yeah, because because Shepard is telling lies, thinking they're the truth throughout this whole thing. So he's, Shepard is self-deluded. Yes, he's totally self-deluded. Mm. Whereas Rufus knows the <laughs> truth. He, he knows that there that good and evil exist and that people are good and people are evil, which, which Shepard constantly refuses to believe and they, he, they just need to be fixed their psyche needs to be adjusted all this all this garbage whereas rufus knows that there is this this vast divide between good 
and evil and that it is present in human beings. And, and, and he gets frustrated with his shepherd and he's mean to shepherd because shepherd won't admit that Rufus has a problem and Rufus knows the problem. Uh, Rufus keeps testing shepherd. Do you mm. really trust me? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Do you, you know, you really don't trust me because you're checking up on me. Do you, I've told you I wasn't the one who robbed the house. Mm-hmm. So, but you continue to, to believe that could have been me. I mean, he's just like, just throwing it in his face. Mm-hmm. It's not real well, trust. Sees, you don't have trust. He sees, he sees totally him. through him. Yeah. Well, okay. I guess that those that is the time where Rufus lies is when he lies about not having broken in. Yeah, because he did break in. He did. But I think he's lying on purpose to see what Shepard's reaction is. In the end, he he doesn't rob the place. He just stands there waiting to get caught so he can throw it back into Shepard's face one last time. Mm -hmm. I thought the section where Shepard is talking to Rufus at the beginning is really interesting. It is is maybe the most kind of on-the-nose critique where he is talking to Rufus and he's saying, if you could just understand why you are the way that you are, it would help you to be cured. You know, it's a, it's a very like, uh, kind of on the nose summation of modern therapy and psychology. Yes. You know? <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. Um, and, and in, in all of her, not all, but in a lot of her novels, there is one character, often a boy who, whose soul is being fought for. Uh, this is, this is the case in her second and final novel, the violent bear it away. Um, Young young Tarwater, uh, the the whole book is about whether his soul is going to be saved. Mm-hmm. Here and you have you have two characters in that book: the old Tarwater, his grandfather, and his uncle Ray Bruce, just like Shepard in this mm-hmm. story. And here you have um, the is there is there is there a boy here whose soul is at stake? Yeah. Is Norton. 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 Right. Yeah. Norton stands in the middle of this story. He does, but we still don't have a protagonist. True. So that's what well, I wanted to ask. Norton? What's the role of Norton in this story? Norton could be the protagonist. I think he is. Mm-hmm. What do you think is the significance of Norton kind of coming under Rufus's influence? And then ultimately, why does Norton kill himself? Rufus is the one who leads Norton to truth, right? Norton has no path to truth except through this young criminal. <laughs> right, because his father has totally turned his back on yeah. truth. Yeah. And and Norton doesn't hesitate to like latch on to Rufus. Um cuz he th- I think don't you think he sees it as a way back to his mother, mm. to the existence of his mother? I think he does, but he also sees, I think, that his dad loves Rufus more than he loves him. And That's so maybe obvious. maybe if he's friends with Rufus, then his dad will start to love I, him. I don't think that's his motivation here. I don't I don't Norton's, Norton's motivation. motivation. Um What do you think? Norton is? is just a very simple character in here. Uh like another character in in um the Violent Baird Way, actually. Here he he's Shepard thinks he's unintelligent. He thinks he calls him stupid. Uh, he times. says uh, below average. Or, yeah, yeah below like that. average. Yeah. yeah, he again a statistical term. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, and you, you you look at him and say, is there anything wrong with Norton? No, he collects seeds. He wants to sell them. He's doing all the things. He's saving a money. Boy does. Oh yeah, right. Yeah. And he even says. You know, when at first Johnson moves in, when Rufus moves in and he says he's not really worried about him trying to annoy Norton because Norton was not bright enough to be damaged much. Mm -hmm. He truly has no respect at all for his son. Right. And and as soon as Rufus shows any concern for him or any, any desire to hang out with Norton, that's what he latches onto. So it's not so much that he's seeking his father's love through hanging out with Rufus, but just like any 10 year old boy would be like, Oh, this person who's older will pay attention to me. Mm-hmm. He, he wants to and hang out with him. there's this kind of irony, I think in this story in that Norton is an innocent. Mm-hmm. He just seems almost completely an innocent character. Um, he doesn't seem to be a sinner. And yet 
the the problem that Rufus sees in Shepherd is the fact that Shepherd, I think this pervades his whole story, denies original sin. He de- he, he he really wants he wants to deny the even the existence of evil, and Rufus keeps throwing evil in his face mm-hmm. so that he will see that there is good and evil in the world. But here's Norton in the middle, and he himself really is innocent. It's like he doesn't have any original mm-hmm. sin. It's a kind of a weird thing in the story. I wanted to ask you all how you interpret the title, but I think that segues to my interpretation of the title. And that is, I think that Shepard in denying original sin, in some ways he's not recognizing fallenness. <laughs> he's not recognizing right. brokenness. And that for Rufus, who Shepard attempts to buy a, a shoe to fix his, his brokenness, or he recognizes that Rufus has an IQ of 140. These things that on a... <laughs> Uh, circumstantial sure <laughs> human level could perfect your circumstances. Don't recognize that there is an inherent brokenness that can't be fixed. Yeah, he physically. wants to attribute everything. Exactly. The, the, the problem is between intelligence and non-intelligence. That's not the problem. Mm-hmm. Um, he 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 just doesn't want to acknowledge certain things. And I think the the shoe is a, is a, is a, is the big symbol. I think in the story because uh, Rufus is club footed. And he wears this big shoe with a big hole in it, with a, with a hole in it, and his in his toes with dirty socks are mm. sticking out. I mean, <laughs> O'Connor d- does the grotesque very well. Yes, she does. <laughs> um, and uh, and so one of Shepherd's Shepherd obviously thinks, well, this is this is really his main problem here. Is he's got this foot, and he, he attributes all kinds of psychological uh, issues to this fact that he's got this club foot, and so he takes. Uh, he, he decides he's going to get him a new shoe for this for the shorter leg he's got, and uh, uh, Rufus doesn't seem to care anything about that. And he finally gets him in the shop, and they put the new. They have to go back twice actually, but they put the new shoe on him, and he rejects it mm. and because he reject- it makes him walk almost straight without a limp. Almost straight without and, and a limp. The first he's time no they longer go, lame. Yeah, yes. the, the first time they go back. His it was like his foot had grown and he was so tickled, like he was so happy that he wasn't going to get that new shoe. Sh- yeah, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because the first time he went, it was too short. The shoe, yeah. the new shoe, was yeah. too short, and he thought it meant his foot was growing. Yeah, right. Instead but, of the fact that the clerk had made a mistake. Right. Yeah. But, but why, why is, was that important to him that his foot was growing? I think he wanted to continue to be lame. No, 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 no. It's the artificiality thing again. I mean, okay. The, the, the fixing of the, the new shoe Rufus sees as this artificial means by which Shepard is going to fix him. Right. So he wants right? to continue to be lame. So he, well, but th- if the shoe is growing, it might make him better. You mean the, the foot. foot? I'm sorry. If, if the foot is growing, <laughs> it might make him better, right? But it's done naturally. It's not done artificially mm-hmm. with mm. this shoe, right? I, I think that's what's going on here. Uh, I mean, throughout this story, I, I think that's the only explanation for why he's I, satisfied that I he thought, might have grown, his foot might have grown. I thought because of the title of the story that he wanted to continue to be lame because I, the lame shall enter I, first. I don't think he wanted to continue to be lame. I think he wanted it to be acknowledged to be real. that it, he was lame. Mm-hmm. That the problem, his problem was not going to be fixed by this artificial shoe. And he waves he waves his old shoe at, at, at Shepard at every opportunity. He does. Because he wants him to say, look, I am lame. Right. And Shepard won't acknowledge it. it. That can be fixed. He wants him to recognize that he's that that he's has a fault. Right. That he and he and there's this really strong scene where um, where Shepard says, I'm stronger than you are and I'm going to save you. Mm. Mm-hmm. The good will triumph. Right. And he says, Johnson, after several more, you know, they're back and forth. You're not going to save me. And then he says, save yourself. Nobody can save me but Jesus. Yes. And Shepard says, you don't deceive me. I flushed that out of your head in the reformatory. I saved you from that at least. He doesn't want to be fixed. All he really, I think ultimately wants is to be saved. Mm-hmm. It stood out to me that there's sim- there's a lot of reference to the space age and space exploration. I mean, it, that's where we end the story um, with the telescope. What do you think is the significance of the space race uh, for Flannery O'Connor's story? And how does that play into these themes that we're talking about? 
Well, I, I mean, th- I think one of the themes in here is the insufficiency of all these modern devices that we have con- concocted uh, to deal with the real human problems. And the term the space age, nobody uses that term anymore. They, I mean, that's like a totally antiquated term, ironically. Uh, that's what was used back in the 60s and 70s. I remember it very well. Uh, you called the space age. And, um, and I think it's just this symbol, uh, like many symbols throughout this, this book. I, I went and circled all the, all the scientistic words in here. They're all over the place in Shepard's uh, dialogue. Um, and I think the, the telescope, um, because he, 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 want, he, he thinks that one way to fix uh, Rufus is if Rufus can get interested in the telescope, if he can get interested in something intellectual, because that's what he thinks his problem is. And Rufus looks at the telescope, and he's pretty quickly bored by it. Yeah, I've seen it. Once you've seen the moon, he says, there's a line in it. Once you've seen the moon, you've seen the moon. I can go on. Um, and, and so this is just another symbolic failure of Shepard's approach, is that the, well, the, the, the telescope isn't going to fix it. Well, he says those spaceships ain't going to do you any good unless you believe in Jesus. Yep. I love this next line. He wet his finger and began to leaf through the pages of the Bible. I'll read you where it says so, he said. (laughs) Right. (laughs) And Shepard says, put that Bible up. Yeah. What I found fascinating about that whole thing was because initially Shepard tries to um, convince Rufus that science is the way to go by getting a telescope, right? That's, but then when the telescope fails, he goes and gets a microscope, microscope. and says, if, if the, if the macro can't do it, then yeah. the infinitesimal will, mm-hmm. you know, and which I, I found that fascinating because one of the major ways that people throughout history have encountered God have been in, in real, in looking at creation and realizing just how magnificent it is, right? And and Shepard is over here trying to use it to draw Rufus away from God, and and Rufus wants to have nothing to do with it, um, it which I found fascinating. He, he replaces the Bible with an encyclopedia, which is another way that she symbolizes this same motif. Mm-hmm. But Rufus is as interested in the encyclopedia as he is in the Bible. Hmm. Maybe because there's no tool through which he has to get to that information in the sense of like, if, if, if Shepard had taken Rufus outside and said, look at the stars with your own eyes versus you have to use mm-hmm. this telescope. Mm-hmm. So it's the, it's the tools, it's the scientific tools that, that he doesn't like, not that he doesn't like the information about the world. Um, and it, it, it's not that he doesn't like to contemplate the world, yeah. but that he doesn't want to have to do it through these artificial tools. But yes. then Norton gets hooked, hooked on, on, on the telescope, on the but artificial. For very different reasons. Mm-hmm. To find his mother. To find his mother. He's not thinking scientifically no. in using. He's thinking very. So why does he hang himself? To, heaven is up when he there. thinks heaven he's found her, why does he hang himself? where we have to come back to. Nobody has given me a satisfying answer for why Norton has hung himself yet. That's true. Oh well, I mean, oh, well, are we are we going to get one? Wait, be, no, because he's 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 well. Sorry, we haven't given you this answer, but it's right there. He's launching his flight into space, so he thinks he's found his mother up there, mm-hmm. and he's conflated heaven with physically up there. And, and the only way to get to her is to die himself. I don't think he intended to kill himself. See, this is why I think it, this end of the story is vague. Thank you. I don't think I, he intended to. Well, what was he doing hanging himself by the neck? It doesn't say that. It doesn't say he hung by the neck. Well, he, well, that's the only way to die. The tripod had fallen and the telescope lay on the floor. Now, I inferred from that that he had hung himself. And I think that that, that, could, that is one potential interpretation <laughs> here. I knew it. <laughs> Be- <laughs> but you're, you're right. So Shane, what do you think? I, if he didn't hang himself, what's going on here? But wait a minute. I, I, let me give you an argument for, for him hanging himself. Very last sentence. A few feet over it, the child hung in the jungle of shadows just below the beam from which he had launched his flight into space. That shows volition. Oh, there. no, I think he, he, he jumped. But whether in that jump he intended to die 
Okay. What else would it? Be? Why did he have? Did he have a rope around his neck? That's why I was going say. back to, to to look at the scene. Remember very carefully when he had when he the rope up? around his legs? Remember mm. he there was a scene where he had a rope wrapped around his legs, and he had and he got up and he was hobbling, and then he took the rope off, and then all of a sudden, to me. I then thought he used it to hang himself. And that's where I, I think actually I agree with Tony's reading that I think he intentionally kills himself to try to get to heaven. I, I And I think, I think that that's, that's how I would read it. The kid got Norton gets so excited about his mom being there and the space age, you can, you can get to space and he just kind of runs out this. I'm just sort of envisioning a, a door, you know, and tries to jump. He's tangled in rope and falls. Yeah. Mm. I, oh, you think? Oh, that could be. That's that's. Well, they, they're in this. They're 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 in this discussion. But the about, child hung. Well, he is. Hi- yes, he is hanging. He hung in the jungle of shadows. That's true. Right, but could he be hanging upside down? <laughs> <laughs> Why are we laughing at this one? Okay. This, this is what this is okay. what O'Connor makes you do. Laugh at these grotesque. Okay, things. so we've okay. got him we've got him wrapped up in the rope. And then the next time the rope is mentioned is when so Rufus and Shepard are talking about the moon, um getting to the moon, and John, and Rufus says the Bible has the Bible has give the evidence, and if you die and go there, you burn forever. And the child leaned forward, and so at this point, Norton is a, gets afraid that his mother is burning in hell, and so he lurches up and and he took a hobbled step towards Shepherd. Is she there? He said in a loud voice. Is she there, burning up? He kicked the rope off his feet. Is she on fire? And that's the only mm-hmm. other time I think the rope is mentioned. Yeah, and I, I think this this is. This is a good lead up to what I think tells me that this was voluntary on Norton's part. Because after that purpose, after that sentence you just uh, read, is she on fire? Norton's asking Shepard. Uh, oh my God, Shepard muttered. No, no. He said, of course she isn't. Rufus is mistaken. Your mother isn't anywhere. She's not unhappy. She just isn't. The, 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 the nihilism of the scientific yeah. position his lot would have been easier if when his wife died, he had told Norton she had gone to heaven and that someday he would see her again, but he could not allow himself to bring him up on a lie. Um, and then, so it, it goes on. Oh. And uh, uh, and uh, it says, uh, pity turned to revulsion. The boy would rather she be in hell than nowhere. Do you understand, he said, she doesn't exist? He put his hands on the child's shoulder. That's all I have to give you, he said in a softer, exasperated tone the truth, at least as he sees it, right? And then um, he says uh, that, that there's a discussion with Rufus involved uh, on, on his mother, and he's asking uh, whether she was in heaven or hell. And, and Johnson says, did she believe in Jesus? Norton looked blank. After a second, he said yes, as if he saw that this was necessary. She did, he said, all the time. <laughs> She did not, Shepard muttered. She did all the time, Norton said. I heard her say that she did all the time. She's saved, Johnson said. The child looked puzzled. Where, he said, where is she at? On high, Johnson said. Where's that, Norton gasped. It's in the sky somewhere, Johnson said. But you got to be dead to get there. That's it. You can't go in the no spaceship. You got to be dead to get there. Yeah. And I, I think... Now, Norton clearly knows this. He's been told this. He believe I presume he believes Rufus here. And then he found his mother mm-hmm. in the telescope. He and he was waving. And then he tried to get to her. What do you think? <laughs> that answers that for me. And I think that this has been a really good discussion of this short story. And if anyone else has a theory about, uh, we would how love they to would hear. Travel, we'd love to hear. But, it. I, but would, I would like to. Say, I think that did it for me because it talks about launching his flight into, into space. space. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And where where Rufus says you can't get there in a spaceship, so right. so Norton's got to do it his way, which you is be dead. Yeah, but this, this is so typical of Flannery O'Connor that she puts truth in the most unattractive characters. 
She the has mouth. so many un- unattractive. unattractive characters. And I will say, too, for anybody who hasn't read O'Connor, a lot of people have read O'Connor and said, no, too rough for me. Mm-hmm. But she is very raw. There is um, a lot of um, pain in her books, a lot of ugliness in her stories. Um, but they are brilliant if you can get beyond all of that. It, these Flannery O'Connor is not for the young. You, we will never be doing Flannery O'Connor in high school. It, I know you've done a short story before in in, in high school. Yeah. In, but, but it's she's really for adults. Yeah, you have to be have have a an ability to analyze literature a little bit in reading Flannery O'Connor. But she she um she just shows that God shows Himself in the unlikeliest places. For our next short story, let's do something a little happier. Yeah, <laughs> let's pick right, a happy one. We'll see you next time. Thank you for listening to this episode of Classical Etc. If you enjoyed this conversation, please consider liking this video. If you want to join the conversation, then you can comment below. And if you want to stay connected, please subscribe to our channel. I hope you enjoyed this show and we'll see you next time.